My name is Tyler Marquardt. I am a writer with Culture Magazine, The Northwest Leaf, and Ladybud Magazine. Uh, I also uh, am part owner of a uh, Vapor Vuber uh, Vaporizer, which is a vaporizer company. You got it. I got it right. Um, and uh, and I'm also uh, in the midst of uh, starting a school in Seattle, um, which is going to educate people from top to bottom uh, about the entire business of cannabis. Um, so. Um, to go over what Dr. Wilson King went over earlier, um, we have different species of cannabis, uh, indica, sativa, ruderalis, chinesis. So all of these are different subspecies of cannabis sativa, um, and they're generally related to what's called land race genetics. So uh, certain regions of the world have certain uh, types of soil and certain environmental conditions that will lead to different phenotypic uh, variations of the, the cannabis plant. Um, uh, biotech is a new realm coming into cannabis in the last five years, uh, and it's going to be making a major, major impact with the ability to do tissue cell culture, um, the ability to breed plants in a far quicker time period and get the results that we're looking for. Uh, generally when we're breeding uh, through common or natural breeding processes, uh, it takes anywhere between six and nine generations to stabilize specific traits. Uh, with biotech, we can do that in a uh, little less than a couple weeks or a month, um, depending on the amount of money we have. So the advances that biotech brings to the industry will be uh, amazing, and they will also be very uh, helpful to not only the producers and processors, but also to retailers who can maybe hold their uh, plants on a little bit longer on the shelf life and um, get a little bit more out of their money. Um, cannibal, cannabinoid profile variances change um, with not only the type of species, the indica sativa ruderalis, but also within that and the growing method you're using. Um, you're going to get a different outcome from soil than you are going to get with um, uh, hydroponics, just because of the availability of what's in the soil. Remember, plants are just like people. You are what you eat, and the same thing goes for your plants. I get that. Okay, cool. Uh, breeding. Breeding is something that is extremely important and uh, everybody should know about, even if you're a home grower. Um, yes, you can buy your seeds offline. Yes, you can get clones from somebody everywhere. But um, to breed your own strains and keep your own seed stock is pretty, pretty intelligent because you want to be able to have access to genetics when you can't have access to genetics. Um, so when we learn about breeding, there's multiple different ways to breed. We can breed either for feminized seeds, which is using certain chemicals to apply or masticating soil uh, root systems or you know, causing some detrimental effect to the plant, um, causing it to herma hermaphrodite and create male pollen. Um, this is not a great way to breed at all. Um, it has caused herm hermaphrodites in plants throughout um, the breeding process because you're stuck with an XXY genetics. Um, you can never get the Y genetic out of there. Um, one of the processes that we're looking at now that can do feminized seeds and can replicate feminized strains is called double haploid process, where basically it takes the X side of the genes and it basically makes an exact copy of it. Um, so that's uh, something that's going to be uh, really big in the future is breeding because a lot of money will be made far more off of seed production than actual production of flowers. Uh, if you're looking at the market right now, you can look at high-end strains uh, charging anywhere between $10 to $50 per seed. So when you're looking at a plant that can produce over 1,000 to 5,000 seeds per plant, um, you're looking at a lot of money. Um, patents and intellectual property is what is going to be a big money maker in this game. Uh, when we look at companies like Syngenta, Monsanto, and uh, all these other biotech companies, they don't make their money off of actual uh, the product. They make it off of the process. So they're not pat patenting the actual plant. They're patenting the process to get to that plant. And that's where they're going to be making their money. And you're going to be seeing that a lot with a lot of other places um, in order to keep their um, recipe a secret. Um, with flavor, potency, and growth characteristics, we're looking at a lot of stuff that's uh, affected by environmental conditions and a combination of genetics. Uh, if you want good plants, start with good genetics, and then start with a great growing situation. Um, hybrid vigor is something that's super important. When you take a 100% indica and you cross it with a 100% sativa, you get what's called hybrid vigor. So you get a stronger plant than the either two in the end that expresses better genetics and will have a stronger immune system. 
Um, clones versus seeds versus tissue culture. What's the best one for your grow? Well, that depends on what you're doing. Um, clones have an advantage of basically being able to get the exact same replication of that plant very quickly into multiple thousands of cuts, depending on how many mother plants you have. Seeds are a little bit more variable because you're gonna have uh, genetic variances due to the uh, breeding, breeding uh, processes and uh, what happens when you're um, dealing with uh, uh, meiosis and mitosis. When you look at tissue culture, that is something that's relatively new to the cannabis world, uh, mostly in the fact that it's a little bit expensive because you need a laboratory, or you don't need a laboratory, but you should have a laboratory to keep things clean. Um, and you know, it's, it's just one of those things, as the industry becomes more stabilized and legitimate, we're gonna see tissue culture um, becoming more pr predominant. Um, there is some really interesting stuff coming out in the future with a couple companies I work with in Seattle that is being uh, uh, patented right now, which will be uh, absolute game changers uh, in the world of getting genetics out there. Um, so what is a concentrate? Let's get to concentrates. Concentrates are basically taking the chemical compounds, uh, cannabinoids from cannabis plants and putting them into a smaller usable form that doesn't have any uh, residual compounds like uh, chlorophyll or any of the carcinogenic properties that are in plants. Um, so when we look at that, we can take anywhere between, let's say we take 500 grams of flour, um, uh, depending on the processing method, to get to the concentrate, you can get anywhere between 10 to 20%, depending on your uh, processor. Good processors will get 20%. So uh, from 500 grams, let's say 10%, we get 50 grams. Um, that's a big loss, and, but a lot of that comes from water weight. Um, even in flour, when you're paying for flour, you're paying for water. It's pretty much 75% water. Um, that's why concentrates cost anywhere between $30 to $60 a gram. Um, they're generally made from trim. Uh, not too often people, people aren't too, uh, people aren't often running nug runs or uh, bud runs or full flower runs uh, just because of the cost of it. Um, trim seems to be a little bit more effective because it's there, it's an excess uh, byproduct of the production system and uh, it's, it allows extra money to be brought in instead of wasting it. Uh, how, are, how are concentrates made? So we have um, closed loop versus open blasting. Closed loop is um, new within the last few years. It's basically uh, borrowing it from the essential oil uh, extraction industry and using solvents um, to uh, pull the active chemicals out of cannabis. Uh, cannabinoids are uh, nonpolar solvents, so that means they're um, able to be dissolved in uh, alcohol or lipids, um, and uh, with uh, alcohol, we're looking at uh, anything like butane, propane, hexane, um, and uh, any sort of those uh, solvents that can um, pull, the, pull the materials out quickly uh, and then leave a low residual through purging processes. So these closed loop systems generally run anywhere between $5,000 and $150,000, depending on the type of system that you're using. With butane, it's going to be a little bit cheaper. Um, with CO2, it's going to be much, much higher because of the uh, plumbing, the um, pressures, and all the other stuff happening with CO2. Um, butane is a phenomenal uh, extraction method, and when it's combined with propane, the two of them together even pull even more uh, terpenes and uh, cannabinoids than just uh, the individual one on their own. Uh, uh, Entane, which is the medical grade version of butane, uh, you need a license to get a hold of that stuff, is uh, the cleanest as far as it goes, better than the canned butane that you can buy in cases at the stores. Um, those have residual uh, lubricants inside of the can uh, to keep the cans from rusting and, and uh, causing other problems, so you have to be careful of that during your purge. Uh, purging is extremely important. Uh, purging is the process of adding um, temperature and pressure to the substance in order to get the residual butane out of the inside of the um, uh, extract. Uh, a lot of the times what we're looking at is the extract is too thick and the, the middle layer will contain butane that can't get out so the, it has to be flipped and broken up in order to get that out. Um, ovens are, are becoming popular um, where they're pressurized laboratory ovens and they're roughly about $5,000 a pop but they're worth it. Um, you can run multiple batches, uh, five to six batches at a time, 20, 20 to 30 grams at a pop so you're looking at 150 grams around that area. Um, 
when you hit open blasting, open blasting uh, is a technique where you take glass tubes that are open on one end, put a filter on it, fill the tube with, um, first you fill the tube with uh, your material, you put a filter at the end, the other end has a small hole where you put a butane can and that's blown into a Pyrex dish. Uh, the problem with open blasting is butane is highly explosive, so if there's anything that can cause a spark around you, it's going to explode. And we've seen a lot of these articles in television uh, mm -hmm. and on the internet where basically people are uh, blowing apartments up and blowing homes up. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and we recently had a federal case where uh, Captain Cosmic, who's a concentrate maker, uh, blew up a, an apartment a few last year and uh, it killed the next mayor of uh, one of the... Um, outlying cities of Seattle, and now there's a federal case being involved. They were raided a few weeks ago for that. Uh, another case was involved a, a few weeks ago next door to a friend of mine who uh, uh, runs his operation. Uh, this other operation had children. Uh, they were parents, and they had the children there. They had a reporter at their house who was doing a story on cannabis. The reporter saw they were open blasting in their backyard and that there was children in the house, called the cops. CPS came and took the kids and arrested everybody. Um, so there are still, you know, things going on that are very, that you have to keep your eye out for. Um, I don't advise open blasting if you don't have a background in chemistry. If you don't know what you're doing, you will hurt yourself. Um, solventless is probably one of the safest ways to go. Um, I would suggest water and bubble hash is a great method to learning how to produce really high quality cannabis uh, extracts. Um, Places like California have outlawed butane uh, uh, production, uh, processing, so you can't even do it there. There's no licensing, there's nothing. Um, so some of the bigger stuff so you might see on the internet, uh, a guy named Matt Rise is out of California. Um, he has a, uh, a company that he works with where they do uh, strictly just uh, water hash, and uh, they're really doing some of the best in the country at this, at this point. Uh, he infuses a... Um, uh, these things called juice roll-ups, and they're kind of like fruit roll-ups, but that are uh, uh, made with uh, applesauce and uh, uh, concentrate. Um, so the solvent list is nice. Um, water is technically a solvent, but cannabis uh, has a very low solubility in it, so it acts more like a mechanical mechanism in knocking off all the, uh, the, the um, trichome heads uh, for collection. CO2 is just really expensive. Uh, and it has its advantages because it's non, it's not a, it's not a solvent uh, for uh, cannabinoids. So um, it's an inert medium, really nice to use if you're not if you're worried about having butane residuals in your um, uh, concentrate. It also leaves a very floral flavor, uh, much different than butane. Butane kind of uh, extracts more of the um, other terpenes that uh, Dr. Wilson King was talking about um, that give it more of a uh, maybe candy flavor or any other characteristics that you might think of, like blueberry or strawberry or something like that. Um, but the CO2, you're going to get a predominant usage in uh, uh, floral terpenes. Um, so solvents, we have, like I said, butane, propane, and entane. And uh, again, uh, what we're looking at in Washington State now is with all these uh, instances of people getting hurt, uh, they're going to actually start regulating butane like they do with Sudafed. So you're no longer going to be able to go into uh, your Walmart. You're no longer going to be able to go into your Rite Aid and uh, anything and just buy a case or five cans of butane. You're going to have to show ID. You're going to have to be limited to one to two cans per purchase. Um, and that just basically... Be has come about because people have been, uh, you know, blowing themselves up, so they have to be able to regulate that in a way so that other people don't get hurt. Um, when, oops, I'm going back here. Uh, so with concentrates, what we're looking at when we produce them, uh, the filter screen will keep out all your contaminants such as plant material and uh, fatty lipids from the plant. Um, Different screens can be used right now. A company called Mean Screens produces probably some of the best uh, products out there. It's a uh, I believe it's a stainless steel, and they may have a titanium version too, uh, but the, it catches a lot of the uh, plant lipids, and it also uh, does a really good job at allowing terpenes and cannabinoids through. Uh, paper filters can also be used, lab-grade paper filters, and they do a pretty good job at uh, catching um, uh, lipids, but uh, they also let a lot of uh, material go through, and they're softer, so sometimes they can blow out if your uh, PSI is too high, which means you basically just wasted your whole run. Um, the catch plate at the bottom it can be made out of a couple different materials. Pyrex is a common one, um, and uh, stainless steel is another common one. Uh, I prefer Pyrex because when you're using Pyrex, it just is a little bit more stable than uh, stainless steel. Um, you know, I'd, uh, stainless steel is nice because it doesn't shatter. So if you drop your plate and you shatter, there's going to be glass in your material. Then you have to throw it out because that's not usable material. 
Uh, with stainless steel, if you drop it, you're going to dent it. Not that bad. Uh, but then there's also problems when if it's pressurized and you dent something, you can cause a crack and then you can cause an explosion in your, in your drop plate if it's cracked and uh, under pressure. Uh, we talked about purging earlier. Purging is essential uh, to get out all the, the gnarly stuff that's left at the end, uh, butane residuals and all that good stuff. Uh, don't pass on the purge, please. It's, the longer the purge, the better. Um, you'll, you'll thank yourself in the end for that one. Uh, handling and packaging, super important when you're talking about concentrates. Your skin uh, produces excessive amounts of oils, and uh, they can get on those concentrates and uh, adulterate them. Um, it's just gross, especially if you uh, have used the bathroom and you didn't wash your hands. There's a possibility of getting other bacteria on there. Um, so you don't want to endanger the welfare of your patients. Make sure you always wear rubber nitrile gloves, latex gloves. Um, and uh, yeah, light, heat, and oxygen are obviously some of the things that degrade cannabis and their uh, chemical constituents. So you're definitely going to want to make sure to keep uh, your um, samples cool in a cool, dry area that has some sort of uh, elimination of light, uh, either if it's a, bl a brown glass, green glass, blue glass, or a sealed container that's like, you know, just totally light proof. Um, all three of those, uh, including skin oils, will have a major detrimental effect on your concentrate and uh, will break down much faster. Uh, let's see. Plant science. Organic. 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 Organic is the worst term you could possibly use to describe your plants. I hate it. I don't like it in agriculture. It's, it's just, I, I hate it. Um, organic was a term derived by the United States uh, Department of Agriculture to uh, basically help uh, farmers create a niche market um, outside of the um, conventional synthetic gro uh, growth market, which was created in the early 1900s. Um, organic means nothing. In the medical marijuana community, in the marijuana community, it means absolutely nothing. You don't have a marijuana, you don't have a, um, you won't and you won't, you won't get and you don't have an organic certification from the USDA to produce marijuana. Uh, it's a Schedule 1 substance, so it will not happen until it's removed from Schedule 1. Um, so therefore, you cannot label your product organic. Uh, you will get sued. Um, and then the biggest reason I don't like organic is because the, the term organic, I do, I grow organically, but I don't like the term organic because it, it's often confused with the, the chemistry term. Chemistry and, or, and, and agriculture, the term organic has two completely different meanings. Organic chemicals can kill you. They are very detrimental. They have uh, very detrimental effects on humans when they're not handled properly. Um, organic agriculture can use organic chemicals in ways, so you can't, you don't want to get them confused and, and have, say, oh, this is organic cannabis, but meanwhile, you're, you're spraying maybe a detrimental organic pesticide on your cannabis, and that's being done late in the stage, and it's given to somebody with an immunocompromised system, you are endangering their welfare. Um, so make sure you read and understand and have a, a very good understanding of what organic chemistry is before you go around and start spouting out organic terms and stuff like that. Um, biotech, like I talked about earlier, is one of the most exciting fields coming into um, the production of medical cannabis. Uh, with a double haploid process, we can literally take one half of the genome, the X side, and replicate it, and we're ending up with an exact, pretty much an exact female copy of what the plant looked like before. Um, it's really interesting. It's coming online pretty quickly, and it's going to save a lot of breeding time for our breeders. Um, Agrobacterium is a virus that uh, biotechnology companies like Monsanto and Syngenta use to genetically modify plants. It's a natural found uh, soil bacteria um, that, and when you look at trees, if there's a big like lump or like what you would consider a spare tire around a tree, um, that's agrobacterium. What it does is it injects its uh, own DNA into the other plant living organisms uh, and kind of becomes a, uh, like a symbi symbiotic relationship uh, and it kind of li lives off of the other host, kind of like a parasite. Um, and so what we can do is we can manipulate this uh, bacterium and uh, basically genetically modify plants and have mutated outcomes, um, and we can directly get different plants that we would normally not be able to get uh, through selective breeding processes. Um, there are benefits and negatives to like everything. There are benefits and negatives to this too. Um, 
I'm not going to get into it because it's pretty controversial and most people don't actually understand the underlying science behind it, so it's pretty difficult to have an argument or even a discussion. Uh, gene guns are another way we can uh, use biotechnology um, to change and manipulate um, uh, genomes. Uh, in case you're wondering, um, selective breeding and biotechnology are pretty much the same thing. Organic is genetically modified organisms. If you take a look at a watermelon or a banana, there are no bananas in nature that do not have seeds. It doesn't exist. Watermelons have seeds naturally. There is no watermelon that doesn't have seeds because if it didn't have seeds, it wouldn't be able to reproduce. There would be no next generations. We have been genetically modifying plants since we started agriculture, selectively breeding plants. We are selectively breeding for specific genetics. That is genetic modification. Now we're able to do it in the laboratory, except for we're able to do it in a slightly different way. We can do certain things like, hey, I can take uh, genetics from a, a salmon fish and insert it into a, into a plant to increase uh, frost resistance. Uh, this may be a good thing, this may be a bad thing for certain people. Uh, at the same time, I can also do something called uh, overexpression or nullify, so where I can take a gene that already exists in this plant and overexpress it. If I really love the smell of lemons in my plant, I can find the gene that produces those terpenes and I can overexpress that, and I can make my plant smell like a bucket of lemons. I can do the same thing and I can, I can knock that gene out and I can make my plant not smell at all and I can grow 200 acres of marijuana and you could drive by and never smell a thing. So, but there's a detrimental effect to that. Also, terpenes, like Dr. Wilson King said, have a biological defense mechanism. Um, it would be like basically messing with your immune system, you know? People smell certain ways because it's attractive to certain people and it turns other people off. So there are, like I said, negatives and benefits to everything. Um, it's how you understand the science and how you apply it is what's really important.